Um, today I'll be presenting on Blaze. Um, specifically, I'll be talking about how interprocedural reasoning uh, might make us uh, um, might might help us make uh, reverse engineers' lives a little bit easier. Um, okay, um, I'll jump right into the motivation. Um, here we're looking at uh, an excerpt from a, a piece of firmware from a, a WD My Cloud, uh, which is a consumer-grade uh, network attached storage device. Um, one of its features is that it allows um, authorized users to search for and retrieve uploaded media files. And it does this through a, a web interface, um, a CGI-based web interface. Um, and we can see at the very top that we have a, a source of attacker-controlled data um, through the um, HTTP uh, form strings um, called start and count. Uh, we also see at the bottom we have a vulnerable sync, um, the call to the C standard library function system. Um, and what's more is there is a data dependency between the source and the sync. Um, however, what we're not sure of is uh, are there paths uh, between the source and the sink? Um, are any of those paths feasible? Meaning, um, are they possible to exercise at runtime? And what can we learn about what must be true in order for one of those paths to be exercised? Um, we can see that uh, the feasibility of any path from our source to our sink uh, depends on a procedure which is helpfully labeled as authentication check. Um, this authentication check function gets past the other two HTTP uh, form strings, the username and password, um, which are also uh, attacker controlled. Um, and it's clear that this, uh, this function must return a, a non-zero value in order for us to reach our vulnerable sync. Uh, diving deeper into this authentication check, uh, we can see that um, the first thing it does is it base64 decodes its second argument, which we just determined to be the password input. Um, it then compares its first argument, the username input, to my dlink bryonig, which I hope I'm pronouncing correctly. And it compares the base64 decoded password to another hard-coded value. Um, if both of these inputs pass their respective checks, uh, this authentication check returns a successful value. Um, excuse me. Uh, if this authentication check, um, which we now know to actually be a developer backdoor, passes, uh, then we have a feasible path from the untrusted source to the vulnerable sync. Okay. Um, in order to prove out this vulnerable path, we had to manually track its interprocedural edges and compare data and control flow across multiple functions, uh, which I've labeled B and C here. Um, in actuality, this vulnerability, it, uh, this vulnerability story does not actually start at the procedure labeled B, um, but rather the CGI main function, which is labeled A. Uh, the CGI main function uh, for this web service uh, branches on a, a user-controlled command value, which is also another HTTP uh, form string. Um, and depending on uh, the value of this command ID, uh, the CGI main function can call one of 28 different handlers, um, each one being a possible rabbit hole uh, into reverse engineering possibilities. To address this first issue, it would be nice to be able to consider the entire uh, interprocedural context in which this vulnerable path resides, um, both as a human user, uh, so that we don't need to switch back and forth between functions to compare data and control flow, um, and for automated analysis, uh, for instance, to evaluate the feasibility of interprocedural slices. Um, to address the second issue, we would like to have some facility for focusing in on an interesting slice and temporarily hide the rest of the noise, the 27 other uh, handlers. Um, if we have already identified this path as being possibly interesting, uh, then we want to ignore any other paths uh, which don't eventually get us to the, the interesting location. 
Um, please see our paper for more details on other features in Blaze, which help to establish some initial points of interest, uh, namely guided POI search and type errors. Um, these two goals can be summarized as using automated analyses to interactively help reverse engineers manage the inherent complexity of analyzing program binaries for vulnerabilities. Um, to that end, we are developing Blaze, a static analysis framework. Uh, Blaze centers around interprocedural CFGs, uh, which we call ICFGs for short, uh, and a typed intermediate language called PIL. Blaze supports symbolic analysis, uh, namely the determination of path feasibility uh, through the use of SMT. Uh, Blaze is open source, written in Haskell, and it has support for many executable formats, architectures, and platforms by providing import functionality uh, from either Binary Ninja or Ghidra currently, and is uh, extensible to other uh, disassemblers as well uh, through a, a, almost a plugin architecture. Um, to our, understand our primary representation of uh, ICFGs, I'll contrast them with uh, plain old CFGs um, or control flow graphs. Uh, on the left, we have a procedure named BAR, um, which is kind of fitting name. Um, uh, BAR has uh, an if then else control structure in it uh, and one function call. Uh, on the right, we see a, a CFG for BAR um, as computed by Binary Ninja. Um, and it's uh, also lifted to Binary Ninja's medium level IL just for brevity on this slide. Um, the if then else is represented as a final if statement in the first block. And the first block has two outgoing branches, which represent the then and the else uh, branches of that if then else. And um, of course, they're labeled uh, according to, to which branch they are. Um, the function call uh, that was in bar is simply represented as an inline statement, which doesn't introduce any uh, additional basic block boundaries. Um, we can see that as statement number six on the right-hand side. Uh, while these intra-procedural CFGs represent the contents of individual functions, uh, Blaze's inter-procedural CFGs represent one or more functions which occur within an interprocedural slice of the whole program. Um, to the intraprocedural CFG, uh, the plain old CFG of one function, uh, we separate out all the function calls um, that are in it into uh, what we call call nodes. Call nodes can be expanded um, either by a user uh, or by an automated analysis. Um, and by expanding a call node, Blaze replaces that node with the uh, ICFG of the called function. Um, at the boundaries between the caller and the callee, after a call node expansion, uh, two additional nodes are added, uh, an enter node and a leave node. Uh, these nodes represent a change of context um, from the caller to the callee and from the callee to the caller. Uh, respectively. Um, excuse me, sorry. Changed the order of the slides just this morning. Um, uh, just one more bit of background. Uh, for many of our analyses, we are concerned with uh, nodes, um, uh, w w which nodes in an ICFG dominate uh, which other nodes. Um, a node X in a, a CFG is said to dominate a node Y if uh, every no if every path uh, from the root to Y uh, passes through X. Uh, put simply, X dominates Y if the only ways to reach Y are through X. Um, we also consider a dominance relation uh, the dominance relation across interprocedural boundaries, um, as we can see in this image. Um, it's also important to note that. Uh, nodes do not necessarily have unique dominators. Um, for instance, the node labeled C uh, is not only dominated by the node B, um, but also by the node A, as well as all of the nodes between A and B. 
Um, with that out of the way, uh, now we can understand uh, what we call branch contexts. If a node is dominated by a conditional edge, then it is said to be in that, ed in that edge's branch context. Uh, every branch context is associated with a constraint, um, a symbolic binary constraint, a, a Boolean constraint, excuse me, um, uh, which represents the condition under which um, that conditional edges um, uh, excuse me, sorry, uh, under which that conditional edges source block will select that edge at runtime. Uh, branch conditions can be nested. Uh, for instance, the node labeled A here uh, is under both uh, the context of the first node's false branch, as well as A's immediate predecessor's true branch. Um, we can utilize branch contexts and their associated constraints in order to determine if a node can be feasibly reached at runtime. Uh, for instance, um, in this ICFG, uh, which has one expanded call, um, the node B is within two branch contexts. Uh, the constraint for the first branch context asserts that uh, argument one, um, uh, the called function's first argument, argument one must not be zero. Uh, the constraint for the second branch context asserts that var underscore 10 uh, must equal zero. Um, through copy propagation, it can be determined that var 10 must equal arg1. Thus, the conditions associated with uh, node B's branch contexts, taken along with some global constraints, which apply to the entire ICFG, uh, can prove that B is unreachable. Um, when the called function is considered in this specific call site. Uh, this could only be realized by examining the inter-procedural relationship between these two functions. Um, okay. Um, in this image, we can again see the caller and callee, um, except we now know that there are certain infeasible nodes and edges in the callee. Uh, when this callee is um, considered at this particular call site. Um, thus, when expanding this call node, uh, Blaze can automatically prune away um, those infeasible nodes and edges, uh, simplifying the resulting ICFG. Um, in real-world examples, uh, this can lead to dramatic reductions in complexity of ICFGs, uh, such as this example in the CVS, or Concurrent Versions System, uh, server binary. Uh, the nodes which would be removed automatically uh, are highlighted in red. Um, to give one more idea of the power of these automated reductions, uh, we return to the CGI main function from earlier. Um, if we decide to focus on a context where this function is called with a command ID of 51, uh, which just happens to be the ID that corresponds with the handler we were looking at earlier, um, which is also highlighted in red, but it's quite small because um, we're quite zoomed out. Um, if we focus on a context um, uh, where this function is called with command ID 51, uh, then we can reduce an ICFG of over 1,500 nodes and 1,600 edges to one with only 71 nodes and 74 edges. This is the resulting ICFG. Uh, furthermore, uh, any remaining but uninteresting nodes can be hidden with node grouping, um, which we detail um, in our paper. Um, sorry, I added a conclusion slide this morning, but I forgot to um, submit it. But um, I'm going to say, in conclusion, um, interprocedural uh, reasoning has allowed us um, to uh, to explore uh, oh this and other vulnerabilities in program binaries uh, without forcing the user to um, to manually keep track of state um, and control flow across multiple functions. Additionally, um, consideration of functions within concrete calling contexts as well as the automated pruning of infeasible paths, given such a context, uh, allows us to dramatically reduce the complexity 
um, of some ICFGs, uh, potentially avoiding reverse engineering rabbit holes. Um, the implementation of Blaze is available on our GitHub, uh, where we welcome contributions. Um, I can now take any questions. If you do any evaluation on how uh, scalable your road is, the size of binaries, uh, it can, uh, the complexity of the control flow res. Uh, great question. Um, yeah, so uh, as we saw earlier, um, you know, ICFGs with thousands of nodes um, perform actually fairly well. Um, to perform that um, automatic pruning, it takes a couple seconds on my laptop. Now, we do have one source of, uh, uh, we're, we're being naive in, in one location where we kind of have quadratic blow up in the number of nodes. Um, but that's something that we could uh, easily switch out with a more performant algorithm as well. And one further question. Uh, how do you handle indirect control flow? Oh, great question. Um, yes, yeah, so our call nodes, um, obviously, if there's an indirect call uh, and you go to expand it, uh, Blaze can't uh, automatically determine. Um, which uh, function call should be replaced at that call node. Um, so for now, uh, it basically pops up the dialog and asks the user, hey, you know, which function whole program did you want me to replace it with? Um, but we have some ideas for future work uh, where possibly we take our, um, our type inference that we detail in the paper and reduce the number of functions based on you know, the type of the, uh, the call function and the types of the candidate functions. Um, or, or possibly other um, more dynamic approaches uh, to, to reduce that candidate set. Thank you. Okay, uh, I have one question. Uh, how do you evaluate your tooling? I mean, is uh, fuzzing for some kind of panic runs to make sure that the basic notes that you consider are not reached by a deal or Oh, oh, if we um, erroneously determine that the block is unreachable? Sure. Oh, so um, we actually uh, we aim to be very conservative in, in which blocks we consider unreachable. Um, if anything, we err on the side of um, not removing blocks if, uh, if we're not sure in any cases. Uh, I think there was maybe one question in the back. Hi, Ian smith Travis. Um I'm interested in what occurs in your analysis when the user does not elect to like sort of inline function definition. For instance, like we have like we still have a call node uh, to some function, but let's even say it's a recursive function, um, and you have a call node and you're not inlining it, and then we have some blocks under it, and we're concerned that like um, is some block following this ritual? Um, do you? Does your analysis essentially treat the state after that call as opaque, or, or what's going on there? Uh, thank you, that's a good question. Um, yes, yeah, so most of our analyses consider call nodes to be black boxes, um, as far as uh, memory is concerned anyway. As far as um, like local state, uh, so like the stack and registers, um, we rely on the disassembler's um, notion of um, you know, calling and caller preserves uh, state. Um, however, uh, you know, allowing the user to um, you know, specify how many layers deep they want to expand um, basically allows them to express to our analyses uh, how far they want the analysis to, uh, to examine. 